Smith University of London, UK. I'm a developmental psychologist. We have a great panel of, I think it's nine, correct? Nine keynoters here from varied backgrounds, but all specialists in their area. We're going to hear from them shortly about their views about where's the bullying research program going and where should it be going? <coughs> so I'm just going to give a very brief introduction. <laughs> then we'll go over to them. And then in the second half of the presentation, I'll be inviting questions and comments from all of you as well. But just as a way of brief introduction, I wanted to point out how the volume of research on bullying has grown so fantastically, really, over the course of the last, say, 50 years. Uh, along the bottom here, we have five, well, five-year periods, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 96 to 2000, 2000, and one to 2000, and I can't really see it well from here, five, 2006 to uh, 10, 2011 to 15, and you just see this massive increase. This is putting in the word keynote, keyword bully into Web of Science and just seeing how many results you get. It's obviously a bit rough and ready, but what you can see is very few publications up till the 1980s, then quite a trickle coming in here, and then suddenly this burst upwards in the last 10 years. I did look to see how it's, these are in five-year periods. We're still into the next five-year period. But I did look at the years 2016, 2017, 2018, and the publications were roughly 1,250, 1,280, and 1,330 in those three years. So in other words, this is leveling off now, slightly increasing, but at around the level of 1,200, 1,300 articles per year. That's about four a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you feel you well, if you, if like me, you're trying to keep up with what's being published, you know, <laughs> I guess many of us have this experience of, of printing off things that you got from ResearchGate or somewhere, or colleagues have sent you, take it back home to read in the evening, somehow you don't, and there's a big pile of manuscripts, actually, of my, of my study at home waiting to be read. Well, this massive increase, and of course, if you think about it, there's about a thousand people here, not necessarily right now, but at the conference, and if each of them was doing one article a year, you're going to get this sort of volume of about a thousand or plus articles per year. So it's a massive research effort now and in the last few years. So uh, apart from the difficulty of keeping up with the research, there's also the issue about are we justifying the immense research effort now going into bullying. Um, we could be doing other things. We could be looking at um, child trafficking. We could be looking at reading disabilities. We could be looking at autism. We could be looking at attitudes to climate change. There are a variety of things that are socially worthwhile that we could be doing. Is it right that there's this big effort going into bullying? Are we defining bullying the right way? Are we defining the research program the right way? Can we justify this great effort that's going in to, to research from thousands now of people internationally? So that's really what we're going to ask our panelists. So what I'm going to ask them to do here, I've just for introduction, um, I'm going to ask them just to say who they are. Many of you, of course, will know who they are, but not everyone will know everyone. So who you are, um, where you come from, your discipline, I think, will be interesting. And then one suggestion from each person for the moment, one suggestion about where we should be going with our research program. So um, if we can start, I think that's Kevin there, right? On the, yeah, nearest here. So Kevin. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin Kumashiro. I'm the former dean of the School of Education at the University of San Francisco. Um, I think what I would recommend is that research look more at trying to trouble what has become very commonsensical among scholars and educators, even those of us who consider ourselves experts on bullying, as we think about what does, what does conventional wisdom tell us are the problems and the solutions, and how might even that be getting in the way, particularly if we focus so much on disciplining. For example, we often think about, um, you know, common sense often tells us that the problem is about trying to prevent the act 
But what if we were to focus more on the norms and ideologies and narratives that demand those kinds of acts? Or sometimes we focus on the problem as the interpersonal relationships and we try to heal those relationships. But what if we were to focus more on the, the institutional context and the institutional violence that happens, including in the solutions we implement, like around criminalizing bullies? And then finally, we often think that the solution is about stopping the behavior. But what if we were to think more broadly about ways in which schools actually demand that kind of behavior? I think some of us would say that schools were not set up as kind of e equity institutions, that they often were in the, f in the service of colonization and socialization. And bullying might actually be a sign that schools aren't failing, but that they're succeeding at a, doing exactly what they were set up to do. Um, and so these are some of the questions that I would urge us to grapple with as we look forward to more research. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jian? Sorry, Christina, maybe next? Oh, Christina? Okay. Sorry, Christina next, maybe? <laughs> okay, so I'm Christina Salmivalli. I'm from the University of Turku, Finland. And myself, I have been very focused on intervention work for more than 10 years now, and, and I... I think that, uh, yeah, maybe my thoughts are mostly there in the interventions. It's very difficult to move away once you have taken that path. I think that uh, initially when we started creating intervention programs and evaluating them, it was really important to, to do um, high-quality, stringent evaluations of the impact that we are able to have with our preventive interventions. But I think that now one thing where definitely we should move when we think about intervention research is really uh, to look at the mechanisms through which the interventions work. And maybe even more importantly, to look at the failures in interventions, the things that do not work, and the cases in which our effective and evidence-based interventions don't seem to lead to the outcome that we would hope for. So I think that we have been very busy in inter prevention, intervention research in, in showing that, that this thing works and, and this program works, and we have been focusing on the successes. But I think, and of course that's important, and we have to celebrate the successes, but still it's important that we don't close our eyes uh, from the fact that there are also many failures, many cases in which we, we can't we don't seem to be able to stop bullying so easily. Challenging cases, as I said this morning, and this is one direction, I think, to go. Yes, thank you. Actually, I think it's very important that we do learn from failures, and um, it's important to publish failures as well as successes, especially if in that you can discuss why perhaps something failed. I think that's a very important message, actually. Uh, Rene? Yeah? So uh, I'm René Feinstra, I'm a sociologist, and uh, I work at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And uh, I was supposed to be last, so I hope that, uh, that Soka would be then the next. So if I would have been last, then I could have said, you are all wrong, and then I could have my one minute. But okay, Peter didn't follow my suggestion. Um, but, but I think that, um, that, that, that Two speakers, previous, two speakers, uh, previous speakers were, were not wrong. Uh, I fully agree. And, uh, but I also think that we, uh, and definitely the young scholars in the audience should also think about where the field is standing. And, and for example, uh, about uh, 25 years ago, Christina Salmifali started with the idea of the participant roles. And, uh, and that was published in 1996. Um, but we have to think whether that uh, paradigm of participant roles is still so informative. And, and, and of course, it, it might be that some of the questions uh, need to be answered with that approach. But uh, young people also have to think about, for example, collecting social network data. Because uh, to me, it seems that if you know who bullies whom and who defends whom, that we get much more precise information about the roles in the classroom. And we know that uh, the roles are very dynamic. So people can be a bully to some, but a defender to others. Sometimes they can uh, be the assistant, et cetera, et cetera. So we really have to know uh, the, the, the social uh, network relationships. Okay, thanks, Renee. Shall we go to Shoko next in front of you? Okay, thank you. Um, 
Is this working? Okay, okay. So I'm Shoko Yonayama from the University of Adelaide, Australia. Uh, I'm Japanese and my disciplinary background is sociology and also I'm a Japan specialist. Um, I'm speaking with Japan as my reference point, but I suggest that we include politics of school bullying in our research and thinking. Of course, bullying is um, ubiquitous, but as far as school bullying is concerned, um, it, is, it has a lot to do with what teachers do or don't do, or, and what they can and what they can't. And teachers' actions are often dictated by their work conditions, workload, duty statements, and performance evaluations, and etc. To review them critically from the viewpoint of school bullying, will require political will, um, leadership, and commitment that goes beyond boundaries of um, what's normally expected as um, anti-school policies, anti-school bullying policies and measures. Uh, it requires courage to reassess the education system itself. To the question is how far we are prepared to go. So, but to begin with, I suggest that we expand our imagination to include politics of school bullying uh, in our research, thinking, and anti-bullying practices. Thank you. Thank you, Shoko. Um, Michael? Thank you. Um, am I on? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm Mike Chove. I'm from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. That's 11 plus hours to get here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, formerly I was the acting deputy vice chancellor for research and internationalization. Um, currently I'm back to the, in my department where my research project is on mobile bullying and mobile bully victims. Um, going forward in different areas, um, I would really be emphasizing areas of looking at the uh, theoretical validity of how we get to measure bullying. Um, uh, that's one aspect I would think, though, and in that case, we'd be looking at the differences in the definitions and also in order to provide validity in the ways by which we get to measure, you know, the, uh, the levels of bullying. And I understand there are different ways by which we can do this, but I think that would be a great contribution. The other area that we see, I see going forward in addressing this problem has relates to the um, working with the community. Someone, the previous presenter here, talked about the external environment, you know, the, 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 the communities, the police, and all those who are working with us. In our case, in, in our project, we are trying to look at how do we get to train the schools and the environment on what we call digital forensic readiness. So these are instances which occur in schools they don't know how to deal with these problems. They don't know where to start from. And sometimes they're a bit concerned about, you know, what do we do, what do we report back to the police? So that kind, kind of becomes a deterrent. So that's one thing that, we, you, know, you know, I would say that going forward and addressing this kind of problem would be important. And of course, there are other areas that we need to be looking at. Uh, the, the extreme areas like, for instance, mobile bully victims. Those are students who are combining the two. Not much research has gone into that. Okay, what do we deal with that? In our case, we find in about um, a sample of about 4,000 students, we'd always find about 10% 10, 10 of that sample in, in our studies turn out to be bully victims. You know, so, so that's one area that we need to be looking at, you know, going forward. And of course, the rest, as you could see, have been identified by my colleagues areas of intervention, we get very much into what we call digital intervention. Our research is showing that where you design digital interventions, the school students would find or the victims would find it much more easier to use, to report, find it you know, readily available, accessible, and so on. So I think those are the different areas I can identify this moment going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Quite a few suggestions there, in fact. Okay, Christian. Okay, well, thanks. Um, hi to everyone, I'm Christian Berger. I'm from the Catholic University in Santiago in Chile. That's 20 plus hours, so I win. <laughs> um, <clears throat> long trip. 
Um, and so my, my research has been going on on peer relations for a long time. I started uh, researching on negative relationships, uh, bully victims, for instance. And my work has been shifting to more positive relationships, uh, friendships, support, uh, helping relationships. And, and if I scale that up to, to uh, school-level issues, I think that the, the research on bullying should also take into account, I mean, if we think bullying is a way of doing and creating society, I miss which kind of society we want to create. So I would like to bridge bullying research with, for instance, citizenship research, uh, research on environmental stuff. So how, what's the society we want to create, and how can we understand bullying as a um, challenge that we have to overcome to create this type of society? So kind of make a conversation between negative and positive societies that we're creating. Um, and we can do that at, at the individual level, at the peer relations level, or at the school climate level. So that would be my, my main point. Thank you. Okay, if we can move to Dorte Marie now. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Dorte Marie Sunogo from uh, Denmark, and I'm a professor in social psychology in Copenhagen. And I think we have to know about this issue in very many different ways, actually, and to pull our knowledge together. But one of the one of the points I want, and I have a dream of emphasizing, and that might actually improve our gathered knowledge would be if we could do more of, a, uh, of a, the kind of bullying that sh makes a serious shift from focusing uh, the individual, from seeking out and addressing deficits in individuals, a shift from that kind of research to investigating the social cultural formation of environments that enact bullying practices. This shift, I think, demands serious theoretical work, and it also demands, probably, at least, qualitative methods. But the shift is not done alone by bringing in qualitative methods, because such methods can still be used uh, for individualizing purposes. What we need, I think, is to understand what it is that makes bullying a possible and often also totally obvious response to the social, cultural, technological, and discursive conditions that some children and young people live under. And it's those conditions that we need to address in prevention and intervention strategies too, parallel, of course, uh, to taking care of individuals who suffer in bullying contexts. So that would be my point. Thank you, that's an interesting statement there. Uh, Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Swearer uh, from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and I'm also with Shelley, uh, co-director of the Bullying Research Network. And I'm a, a school psychologist and a licensed psychologist. And so what I think, I always think of bullying from a mental health perspective, and I think it's really important that we start to kind of unpack some of the mental health um, conditions that are associated with bullying, bullying and involvement. Uh, for example, we have a cognitive behavioral intervention where we have a uh, hour-long assessment um, and we've had about 250 uh, young people go through this intervention and not one young person has had the same psychological profile, if you will. And so we have some uh, bully perpetrators who have very high social anxiety uh, we have some bully perpetrators who have very high levels of depression. We have some bully perpetrators who are not depressed at all. So I think we really need to kind of start unpacking some of these mental health uh, correlates and consequences of involvement in bullying. So that's where I would kind of like to see some of the research going. Thank you. And Shelley. Hello, uh, my name is Shelley Emil. I'm uh, from the University of British Columbia in uh, Vancouver, Canada. And um, <clears throat> I'm a developmental psychologist by training turned into an educational psychologist. And as an educational psychologist, I work a lot with schools. And I find that um, bullying research is really important, but it's part of a larger issue in schools. And that's the failure to really address the social and emotional development of children. And what I find working <clears throat> with teachers is that they often do not know what to do and, and, in, and in a sense, try things that aren't there. We have a, a, a heyday of evidence-based practice, but getting that training, I think, is sometimes lost on them. For what we've been trying to do is work with teachers that are in training 
changing the <laughs> teachers that are coming to the future because they quite simply need that background. A lot of what happens in schools is partly because the teachers themselves are struggling because there's institutional bullying as well. We also know that um, although programs, this is not to minimize the importance of anti-bullying programs, they're very important, but they're also no guarantee because we see that they sometimes work and they sometimes don't, Christina's point about the failures. And part of that is uh, helping to do research with c schools collaboratively so that they can also evaluate what's working and what's not working and learn from their mistakes as well. Okay, thank you. Well, that's great. We've had nine, I think, interesting suggestions here and the experts have introduced themselves. Um, I don't want to play too heavy a role in this. I'm going to invite you now to discuss amongst yourselves, challenge each other perhaps about something you might disagree with or say what you do agree with. Remember the topic, we're thinking of where should this massive, now quite massive research program be going? Where should we be putting our efforts primarily? So I invite you to discuss amongst yourselves. I, of course, can intervene if need be, but over to you. So if I may start, uh, so, so Shelley at the end pointed at the role of teachers. And um, so I, I'm wondering, um, because we re represent uh, probably nine countries, um, are there uh, countries where teachers are well trained during teaching training uh, in, in uh, helping children to develop social emotionally and, and to tackle <coughs> bullying? Because in a country like the Netherlands, it's maybe one day in four years. And the rest of the curriculum is not about tackling bullying or social emotional learning. So, so are there other countries that are already much better in this? I don't know about better, but we've been struggling with this one in, in British Columbia for quite some time. And um, what we've found is that if you work with the pre-service teachers when they're training, um, you can actually make a difference in how they see their job. So, for example, for years, I would always get to take all the new students that are learning to be teachers and give them a workshop or on bullying and other kinds of social-emotional topics. And what we found was if they let me have that time with them in the first two weeks of their program, it changed their way of thinking across the whole thing. Yes, they got the academics. And this had created a groundswell over the last 15, 20 years to where recently our Ministry of Education came on board and completely changed the curriculum. So they no longer talk about subject matter, they talk about core competencies of communication, uh, critical and creative thinking, and social responsibility. So I think it's like it takes time. I certainly see it in our schools. I see it happening, but it's taken years to get there. So I think it can happen. I don't know if we're the best by, by far, but at least it seems to be working. Sure. May I take on? on yeah. This? Yeah. So teachers are important on them. And thinking one of the problems I see back in Chile is the relationship between t teachers and family. It's a, a core issue here. We are blaming teachers, but then we need to work with the whole society in, in schools. And the other thing is uh, principles. How are we? Uh, uh, training principals or heads of schools to, to work with teachers and to create this community, this society within the school. So, so teachers may be the, the, the first line in terms of tackling bullying, but then how you create the work with the whole community, so to say. I'm not sure what their experiences in different countries. So I open it to you guys. <laughs> well, I wanted to chime in as well. I feel like with the research on teacher education in the United States, there's so much um, there's so much concern I think that many of us have in terms of the direction that the country is going to really demand more and more that teacher preparation be more about kind of instrumentalism and you know really about preparing people to succeed on standardized tests rather than thinking about how our job is about creating the next generation that can really strengthen democracy. So it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier about um, you know, what's the vision that we're trying to develop, not only in schools, but for society as a future? And how is education moving in that direction or serving in a totally antithetical way? When you think about the diversity in the United States in terms of, you know, the different states and then rural urban issues and not only in terms of teacher training, um, but then also in terms of every state department of education is different and has different impacts. 
uh, in their own states. And so there's just so much variability, and I think some states do a better job than other states. We found, um, we did a scan a few years ago, a couple years ago, of uh, programs, teacher training programs in the United States, and virtually none had anything on the social end of things. So I think that's where we have to go back and start. We have to start training a new generation of teachers. And as to your point about the principals and the administration, we have to put that perspective in their heads. So for example, some of our training at the administration level simply puts out a social justice perspective, a diversity uh, perspective. And I think that seems to be slowly growing in, in, in uh, uptake, if you will. But we have to be aware that, uh, I mean, the bullying among children is also reflected in bullying among adults and is reflected in bullying in politics. And I mean, the yes. example you gave of Virginia and the Trump uh, era and how percentages rose now that, uh, that he has sort of really, really introduced, being the president for heaven's sake, introduced bullying as something that's really good. We have a similar kind of person, he's not a president, but we have a similar kind of person in Denmark right now. And we have massive problems of children uh, coming home crying because all of a sudden it's become sort of legitimate to play with hatred at a quite new level. So I think that when you talk about teacher education, um, preparing teachers to do something about these issues in school also in, entails uh, dealing with the politics and with adults' ways of, uh, of relating to each other, and it's a, it's a fairly tough job. We ask a lot from teachers, but we have to. Mm -hmm. um, the political, is this working? Political um, environment is certainly very important and relevant. So in the case of Japan in the 1990s, um, particularly after 1995, uh, the economic circles changed the, the way uh, the companies want to employ people. That put a lot of pressure to, well, it, this was basically casualization, introduction of casualization in massive form. And that made, um, created a lot of economic pressure and people started to become very poor because of that. And that changed the, the, the culture of Japan quite a bit. And together with, well, it was basically neoliberalism. And that changed the, the, the nature of um, bullying quite a bit, I think. So uh, it, it's very important for us to consider bullying uh, within school, but also in relation to a broader culture that can be national culture, but also can be more global culture. And the ca casualization is definitely part of that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think what, what, what my colleagues are saying here is very important. And what's important, most important for us would be um, we get to share what others have done in terms of teacher training, like for instance in the United States, in Europe, and other places. I think that would be beneficial for us but I also see one impediment to teacher training and teacher involvement in this. The legislation, sometimes we find it a little bit restrictive. You know, you know, assault, you know, you know wh where do you fall? Should I engage? Should I get involved or not? That becomes restrictive. So again, getting to understand what the legislation says and how we can adopt that and communicate it very effectively to the, to the teachers, that would be important. And the last one I said, I talked about earlier, is the teachers getting into the digital aspect of the technology. It's so complicated when increasingly, like for instance in the case of cyberbullying, is done electronically, you don't know where to start from. What about the teachers who are with the children, with the student? You know, there is need for education so that they get to understand how to deal with those things as part of their preparation, as part of their training, you know, you know, in this, in this case. Okay, thanks. Um, I think fairly soon we'll need to bring in the audience, but I just wanted to put one question to you. Um, no one has mentioned theory much, I don't think. Um, there have been some attempts to bring in some theories into explaining, you know, why bullying happens, why certain procedures might work and others not, but they've been rather patchy and sporadic, I would say. I just wonder if you see this development of theoretical perspectives as being important in the next sort of phase of work. Anyone got any comments on that? Um, I'll try. 
Um, we did a paper recently on the, for the journal Theory to Practice, um, talking about basically the argument that we were posing, posed was um, what theories could we use to address bullying better? And um, I think the theories of group processes are absolutely critical. We have to move beyond the individual, beyond the dyad, and onto group processes to understand the context in which bullying happens and the social context. I personally find Judith Rich Harris's group socialization theory very useful, uh, the theories that are underlying cooperative learning. So there are theories out there that we really haven't applied very adequately to the bullying research, and I think it's time we did. We certainly have moved into understanding those processes as contributing to bullying, but we haven't really put that back into the intervention enough. Mm -hmm. Anyone else okay. commenting on that? Yes, I strongly agree with that. Uh, you, know, you know, that's quite interesting. And, and also, maybe I should add on, is that the existing theories, to what extent have we tested it in different environment? Like, for instance, you might find some theories where based on data collected from urban areas, to what extent are they applicable to situations in rural areas? So, so that's something that we might, we might also have to be, you know, looking at going forward. Yeah, I, I think that we also need development uh, in, in terms of theory if we apply it to social norms and social networks. So, so we know that group processes are important, um, but how it exactly works, we sometimes do not know. And to me, it came a bit as a surprise, for example, in a paper that uh, I co-authored with Rosemary van der Ploeg, and that was published this year on social networks, that that uh, the popular bullies are always seeking new targets. And, and now that we know that from that uh, social network perspective, we, of course, can say, OK, yeah, that's obvious. Because it, as soon as you dominate a, a specific person, you can look for a new target. But only if you have uh, longitudinal data with multiple waves. We had five waves. And if you have uh, detailed social network data that, so that you really know who bullies whom, you can uh, take that perspective and also de de develop the theory further. And also with social norms, I think that um, we, we know a lot about social misfit theory or we know uh, uh, things about pluralistic ignorance, but how the process exactly works and, and what the real mechanisms are, that is something that we never uh, measure. So we assume that we think that it works in a certain way, but m some things can be explained in in the same way, uh, with the same outcome, but the mechanism would be completely different. And so we have to specify the mechanisms. Mm. Thanks. Um, I can yeah, okay, I quickly, Dr. Me, yeah. Um, I think when we discuss theories, there, there are, of course, very good theories and very productive and helpful theories at the level of explaining particular kinds of, uh, of phenomena, but that we also need to be aware of the kind of more abstract theoretical information that we use to think with. And we have had very good uh, suggestions as to how we should understand the constitution of individuals, individuals in social contexts, individuals as produced through, as it was called, and all that sort of things. But now that we have technology, we have cyberbullying, as it's called, we have got all the, uh, we've got a much stronger attention needed to the material conditions that also are formative uh, of children, of adults, of schools, of institutions, and all that, all those different things. We need to bring in theories that can actually um, base our understanding of material discursive interaction and what, how that enacts phenomena, including phenomena like, like bullying. So I think we have to be more creative and more uh, use more fantasy, actually, in ways of, of bringing different kinds of theories together. Thank you. I think that's a challenge for us. Well, what I'd like to do now, we've got less than 15 minutes. <laughs> I think, to have some Q&A from the audience. I think there are roving mics. Yeah. So if someone, and it's difficult for me to see, if I can better see now, if someone wants to ask a question, if you could say who you are and where you're from, and then the question, keeping the question fairly brief. Shall we start over here? Thank you. Helle Rappel Hansen. I'm a bullying researcher from Denmark. Uh, I agree 100% about teacher training. But I think we have to go further. We have to ask, 
Training for what? If I am looking at typical intervention in Danish schools, I see that it's very often reduced to talking, talking with the victim, talking with the perpetrator, or things like now we are going to the forest and have a nice time, we are eating together and so on. Activity that is very nice but not linked to the idea of school. The challenge with that is at the same time we say that bullying has nothing to do with school culture. So I think teacher training is also about how can we use curriculum in anti-bullying way, how can we use the teaching, the idea of teaching in an anti-bullying way. So the whole idea with school is the main way to intervention. What do you think about that? Okay, anyone like to take that up? Well, I can say I agree. <laughs> 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 I think this point, I mean, this point of not sort of making a split between what's social and what is something professional or related to learning in school, it's, it's very important to take that, sh that split away and to think about those two things as integrated and to do something about bullying also in terms of making, I mean, the way you do the professional thing, the learning, et cetera, et cetera, a space for developing dignified and acknowledging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, tolerant uh, relations. I, I completely agree. No surprise. Oh, oh, I, sorry. <laughs> I just think we probably should move on to give other people a chance. Okay, sorry about that. Anyone else like to ask yeah. a question? Yeah. Hi, um, my name's Claire Fox. I'm a professor of psychology at Keele University. Um, some of you have talked about moving away from understanding the individual to the social context, um, and I wonder if you think it's still worthwhile to look at individual risk factors. Um, if so, do we need to do that sort of research differently? I think, I think uh, we spoke a little bit this morning. I think you have to do both, look at the individual as well as the context and the, the interpersonal processes. <coughs> and I think um, Sue's point about dealing with mental health is, is also, I think, really critical. I think related to that is uh, something I think that Renee said, I can't remember who said it, is that we have to recognize that responding to bullying as a child is often situational specific that you know, not all defenders are defending in all cases, not all bullies are bullying in all cases, so it becomes really important to think about the individual within a particular situation. Maybe I could add to that, and also coming back to the, the research program and what kind of research we should be doing, I think that we have a much better uh, understanding and maybe also some sort of agreement about prevention and what it should include and how we could enhance social emotional learning and, and, and make it uh, more against bullying in their attitudes. But then when, I, when we think about really individuals who are the targets of bullying or who are bullying others, we, we really don't know so much about the approaches that we should take in intervening in those cases. And we hardly know anything about what teachers in schools are doing in those mm -hmm. cases. We have some studies showing that kids tell that when the teacher has intervened in bullying, it was only helpful in half of the cases, maybe. Right. And those studies are not very specific in telling us what the teacher actually did and why that was not perceived more helpful, but we just know that this seems to be the case. Adult interventions often don't work according to the children. And I think this is one very important thing and I think that maybe I think the emphasis on context of course it's really really important and has been very very uh, critical but but maybe we have forgotten a little bit the individuals and also the indicated actions that are needed when a case of bullying is detected because what I have realized talking to teachers when they talk about intervening in bullying they say, oh yeah, we, we intervene in bullying every day, but they mean uh, that they intervene in single incidents when they witness bullying happening. They go and they tell, hey, what's going on here? Stop that. That's not okay. And then the next day they may do it again 
and the next week they do it again, but they don't realize that this is not really intervening in bullying, because in my view, intervening in bullying is like you say, hey, this child has been in this situation for some time, and now we, we have to do something about it, you know. So it's not only about intervening in single incidents separately, that's not enough. And we really don't know how well teachers have even internalized this idea and what they actually do when they intervene. But I think, I think if you look at the uptake that we have in bullying publications, then um, we know already a lot about individual factors. Um, but now the challenging question is, I think, for those, what Christina talked about this morning, challenging cases, um, we should really think about what is it that some individuals are not helped by the program? What kind of factors do they have and what can we do then? And what is it that some teachers are not uh, very successful in being a role model for their class and uh, cannot change the norm in the classroom? And if we want to understand th uh, these processes, we need the individual factors, but maybe more as the, as the moderators instead of only the main characteristics. Mm. Thanks. Um, I think we've got, I'd like to move on, see if there's any more questions. There's certainly one there. Uh, one Paul, here, okay. Uh, Paul Downs from DCU. Uh, can I ask the panel, do they see the future decades uh, of bullying research as being where bullying research is like an island separate from many other areas which could draw a lot of synergies for it? You know, for example, early school leaving themes, uh, integration of migrants, uh, social emotional education has been mentioned. There may be many other aspects where the discrete, yeah, I know there's been the need early on perhaps to have this discrete identity as professional researchers, as bullying researchers, uh, you know, adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, trauma, all of these angles. Uh, can you see the future dec decades broadening to this? I'd argue that uh, even, say, for example, the example given there about the sort of relational competences of teachers, this is something that would have a common policy lens for a range of these other areas as well, such as early school leaving or integration of migrants. I think that's another, <laughs> we agree. <laughs> we all agree yeah. Is there a question there, Paul? <gasps> and I'd also I think, um, and I also I think um, the, the, the bullying as it relates to migrants is not only limited to Europe or to America, but we also experience those kind of things in Southern Africa where we've got massive migrations of people from uh, different African countries. Now, now the, the problem is that we, we tend to forget that these people are coming from different backgrounds and di different cultural kind of background. So we've got cases where we see that uh, bullied people or you know, migrants tend to identify themselves with where they're coming from. French speaking, try to understand and identify with those who are speaking French in order to, to interact. And English speaking would definitely you know, relate to those you know, that are English speaking. So just to expand on what you're saying, that it's, it's a, a global problem wherever migrants are. And I think it has to do more with the background, with the cultural aspects. And they, you know, also going back to what was being discussed a few minutes ago before uh, the previous you know, uh, person raised this question, culture is a very important thing. So, w and, and it tends to clash with you know, the individual and this cultural background. So those are all complexities that we need to be looking at you know, going, going, going forward. And one interesting direction also would be that um, if we also look again uh, with questions like this from a social network perspective, because if, if I'm a, a male, which I am, um, <laughs> would I then um, uh, d defend females in my classroom? If I'm Caucasian, uh, would I defend uh, black people? I, no idea, uh, because Usually we always think that a defender is a defender for everyone, but that's probably not true. Boys mainly defend boys and girls mainly defend girls. Uh, and it might be the same with, uh, with some uh, ethnic minorities, that they are only held by other ethnic minorities in the classroom. And sometimes they can be very alone then. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Maybe one more question. There was... Okay, here. 
I'm Yuichi Toda from Japan, in Osaka University of Education, doing research in bullying and uh, collaborating with four so many researchers worldwide. And uh, from my experience, this is not from my research, but experience of intervening in schools attached to my universities, culture appears in parents' talk. And some parents say, do revenge, do fight back. Culture appears like this way. So I suppose, uh, uh, as for the theory, uh, not just fighting back justice, but we should see restorative justice. This is very important. And um, I've seen some good presentations in this forum concern concerning restorative justice. So I'd like to know your opinions on this. Thank you. Well, one of the things that I, I, I would say is that uh, a program like Kifa focuses on the class. But parents are important too. So, and it might be that some, at some schools it goes wrong because uh, parents give a different message. And, and one of the nice things is now that we have added a module for parents to the Kiva program in the Netherlands. And it's published in the Scandinavian Journal of Psychology. And it doesn't reduce the bullying, but it uh, increases the trust that teachers have in the role that parents can play, and vice versa. So that is also important. And then, it, and if the message of the school is restorative justice, then teachers and parents should talk about that. And if the message is Kiva, teachers and parents should talk about it. Because if a child is bullied, it's not a problem of the school only or a problem of the uh, family only. No, it's a problem for, for both. Can I add one uh, anecdote to that? When I was in graduate school, I was supposed to be working with kids who were aggressive on a school ground, and I had that very problem of a kid who said, my dad told me to do, seek revenge. And I was kind of at a loss. How do I deal with this? And a teacher taught me this. She said, you know, kids can discriminate contexts. That may be what you learn at home. This is what we do in school. And I think in doing that, you don't want to undermine the parents or minimize you know, their, their uh, influence on their children, but at the same time, you're telling children, teaching children that in some context, this is not how we behave. And I would hope that they, they can have that eventually a time to choose how they want to live and how they want to teach their children. So I think that's, it was a lesson for me. Mm. Okay, I think I'm going to have to wrap things up, unfortunately. I think we should try and finish on time, more or less. I think we've had a good discussion and some interesting questions, um, some ideas about how we should move forward in the next decade. Obviously, there are going to be more meta-analyses of the large number of studies that come out. Clearly, there's a focus on interventions, but not just now on does an intervention work. I think we've established that often they can work to some extent, but why do they work? With which pupils do they work? How can we uh, look at the variation amongst teachers and pupils, the healthy context paradox we heard this morning. Aspects like this are clearly taking the intervention work forward in a progressive way, I think. So that's encouraging. So um, I'd like to thank the panel very much for their contributions and the audience too, for those of you who've asked questions, and we'll conclude. Thank you very much.